Hi, I'm the Hull History Nerd. Welcome to the History of Hull Railways. And in this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the Hull and Hornsey Railway. Well, here we are in Paragon Station again, the starting point of so many of these journeys. And from here, we're looking at going to Hornsey. The first proposal for a line came from a company badly in need of an advertising consultant, the York Hull and East West Yorkshire Junction Railway. George Hudson of the York and North Midland Railway took offence at them trying to enter his turf and submitted his own proposal in 1846. This line would split off from the Bridlington line just north of Beverley and terminate near Hornsey Mere. However, the 1846 proposal was rejected by Parliament. But that didn't stop the York and North Midland Railway. They tried again in the 1850s. But unfortunately, even though Parliament actually approved it, at this point, the dodgy dealings of George Hudson were coming to light and the company was very quickly running out of both money and goodwill. The only major line they opened in the region over the last years of their existence was the Victoria Dock Branch Line. In 1861, the Holland Hornsey Railway, headed by Joseph Armitage Wade, actually were successful and were granted approval by Parliament to build the railway. It actually joined the Victoria Dock Branch Line here. The area is now an industrial park, but this is the spot of the old Wilmington Station. For a few months, this station served as the terminus in Hull for trains to and from Hornsey, with those trains being operated from the start by the North Eastern Railway, who had recently also taken over running of the Hull and Holderness Railway to Withensea. Within a few months, however, the North Eastern Railway chose to run the trains all the way to Paragon Station in order to make a more centralised terminus, and in view of the fact that they now had two active seaside branch lines spinning off the Victoria Dock branch line, in 1866 they reopened most of the stations on the route. People all over Hull could now get the train to Withensea or Hornsey from their local stations, such as Stepney or Skullcoats. But the Hornsey line wasn't quite done with Hull's industry, and here, at a point just after the Chamberlain Road level crossing, the Stone Ferry freight branch splits off and heads east in a curve. So this is a bit of a surprise impromptu piece, as you can probably tell by my ratty cap. I was out filming and uh, I thought, well, that looks inviting. I'll walk down the Stone Ferry branch and see how far it goes, only to find that it pretty much goes all the way to Stone Ferry still. And at the point where I'm at now, this is the point where it crossed over the Fordyke stream, the drain, which has now been culverted and filled in. It is now a cycle track. So this branch would have gone all the way down to the Stone Ferry goods yard where it would have serviced a bunch of local businesses in North Stone Ferry including a, an oil mill which was across the road and which had its own branch line that went across Stone Ferry Road itself. The villages it passed through were tiny hamlets, farming communities one and all. The most substantial village passed through was the charming Sutton-on-Holderness, later Sutton-on-Hull. 
Sutton was close enough to Hull that wealthier middle-class folk had homes here while still being able to journey into the city in order to work. And it was, in character, much like many other nearby villages such as Preston and Bilton. But its proximity to Hull meant that eventually it was absorbed into the city during the council estate building boom of the 1950s and 60s and fully encircled during the 1980s and 90s. Yet, unlike other communities that were also rolled into Hull, it still retains the air of a country village today, with its high street full of a hodgepodge of old buildings, the winding road around the church, and a sense of community that the residents still keep. Of Sutton's station, all that's left is the railway bridge that the line passed under, and the station master's house, now a private home. Now, as we saw last time on the Holland Holderness Line episode, the Withensee branch passed through some of the most important social, political and cultural centres of South Holderness on its route. Places like Hedden and Patrington, for instance. And it ended in a tiny, relatively unknown place, Withensee. The Hornsey branch is almost exactly the opposite. Hornsey was very, very well known, all the way from the Middle Ages. It was known for its market town, for its fishing, and for its port. All three of those things were long since gone by the 19th century, but it had managed to reinvent itself as a resort. A place where the wealthy middle classes could come in their droves to take the waters, to take in the sea air, and also to have a go in the exclusive bathing machines. They had three of them in 1800. Bathing machines, the luxury. In fact, it was so well known that people would come from all over the place, not just the East Riding, but the West Riding and North Yorkshire. Charlotte Bronte came there in 1853. It's fair to say that by the time the railway arrived in Hornsey, Hornsey was already well and truly on the map. But most of the rest of the stations on this line were tiny, small agricultural villages like this one, Swine, so named for its famous pig markets, which is kind of obvious when you think about it. The station building here is complete with platforms, parts of the goods platform, and it was built in 1864 with the rest of the line and closed in 1964. But it's a classic example of a really relatively large station complex serving a very tiny agricultural village. Which begs the question, why build a station at each of these tiny villages? Why not just make the line straight through from Hull all the way to Hornsey with no stops? To answer that question you need to understand just how different the world of the 1860s was from today. If you wanted to go to Hornsey, you couldn't just jump on a handy East Yorkshire bus service. If you didn't own a horse, or you didn't want to spend a day walking, the only answer available to you was to get a coach, which was expensive, had to go over some very rough and muddy bad roads, and give you a better than average chance of getting robbed on the way. Now, Imagine that you're not just a day tripper wanting to spend the day at the seaside, but you're a farmer wanting to sell your wares at market. You were limited by how close the market was, by how much stuff you could fit on a cart, and by how far your livestock could walk. And the railways transformed that very hard limit on how much farmers could sell, transformed it beyond all recognition. This is Skirla Station. It closed in 1957. There's not a whole lot left. It's one of those rare country stations that's actually lost its station building. The platforms are still here though, quite heavily overgrown, but still present. And there's a vague mound just 
near the car park that's actually the remnants of the goods platform. If you look closely under all the undergrowth, you can actually see the wooden steps. This is probably a good place to point out that the old track bed of the Hull and Hornsey Railway, pretty much from where it departed from the Victoria Dock branch line back in Hull, is now a cycle path. And if you've got the stamina for it, you can hop on a bike and ride a cycle all the way along the route that the old trains used to follow. Ellaby Station served a community that was tiny even by the standards of this route. The station here was a market station that only ever opened on Tuesdays. It was closed to passengers in 1902, but the good siding, later renamed Wheelaby Siding when the Burton Constable Station further up the line was renamed Ellaby Station, was still in use up to 1959. Today, the station building remains, along with remnants of one of the platforms. This is the other Ellaby station on the route. Named Martin when it was originally opened in the 1860s and then later that same year renamed Burton Constable, it was renamed Ellaby in the 1920s because the NER's network had gotten so big that there was another Ellaby station somewhere else in the country and in order to avoid confusion when making timetables they managed to change the names of a lot of stations. Behind me there used to be a uh, bridge carrying the road over the train. That's been replaced by an embankment since the closure of the line. So if you're on the cycle track these days, you have to go up the embankment, cross the road, and then down again. As you can see here, there's not a lot left, but the two platforms are here, although very much in disguise, hiding behind uh, a thicket of brambles and trees and bushes. And the station building is just up on the hill, and that's now a private residence. When the railway arrived in these farming communities, it enabled farmers to sell in bulk, and not just to local markets, but all over the north, and, for some, the country. They could load as much as they could move every day to the goods station and ship it to the city, selling food to the hungry cities of Hull and the West Riding. The pace at which they could sell transformed the way in which they farmed, the increasing use of steam-powered traction engines and earth-turning machines allowed larger fields to be farmed with fewer workers than ever before, increasing output and allowing them to compete with an influx of cheap produce from Germany and the Low Countries. Small-scale local farming was out, and large-scale bulk farming was in, and in a big way. And here we come to Whitedale Station, another large station complex that feeds into a number of small agricultural communities, such as Withenwick. This is probably my favourite of the small stations on this route. And the reason for that is that like Otteringham Station on the Withensea branch, it's the best preserved of all of the small station complexes on this line. We have a beautiful, really sympathetically done station house, which is now a private residence. Both of the platforms are in good condition. The coal drops have been made into a feature in the car park. And there's even the remains amongst the trees there behind me of the old goods station. Just as the railway transformed the amount of goods that farmers could sell and who they could sell them to, it also opened up markets for mass growing of fruit and veg. Things that they were particularly good at growing or particular livestock that they were especially good at breeding. No longer having to provide a range of goods at market, and being able to get good prices for a bulk shipment of a single kind of good, enabled farmers to start specialising. If you were growing mediocre onions, mediocre cabbage, but some really top-notch beetroot that you just couldn't grow fast enough to keep up with demand, in the old days you'd still have to grow the other stuff in order to sell it at market. But when the whole country is your market, or at least the whole of the North, you could easily afford to focus on growing the thing you excel at and being competitive. Specialist farming became an important part of the agricultural landscape. And this is probably a good place for us to stop and talk about the other side of the equation. We already saw in Swine that 
these stations changed the lives of farmers. But on a bigger picture, that changed the lives of industrial Britain because you see, back in the early part of the Industrial Revolution and the early life of the railways, there was a new monster in the land creeping across the countryside. These giant industrial cities that were sucking in people from the countryside. And as the revolution went on, that brain drain and labour drain from the countryside got incredibly intense. A series of recessions for farmers, for instance, caused a lot of unemployment and a lot of unemployed farmhands went to the city to look for work. And then increased mechanisation meant that farmers could cut even more jobs. And those labourers again went to the cities. But it wasn't just farm labourers that were leaving in the droves for the cities. There was a brain drain going on as well. Local blacksmiths, local carpenters, local stonemasons. These were trades that were very, very much in demand in industrial cities because there was a lot of stuff that needed to be built in those days. They didn't just use them for their skills, but in the cities they also got to apprentice people so that they could spread those skills far and wide. And these people, they formed the backbone of the Industrial Revolution. But the railway stations and the farmers still out here in the country and these stations dotted every few miles along every railway line that crossed rural Britain were the breadbasket of those cities. Without this and these hundreds of thousands of farmers across the country being able to ship their goods at speed into the cities, the cities would never have grown as quickly as they did or as big as they ended up. So, massively important part of industrial Britain and the way we live today. Of the rest of the stations left on the line, Sigglesthorne is largely inaccessible, being a private residence and the track bed having been cordoned off as private property as well as being apparently very boggy and overgrown. There's little for us to see there. Likewise, at the tiny station of Wasand, the station building survives as a private house, but there's very little of the rest of the station complex to see. And here we are on the outskirts of Hornsey and we come to the first of Hornsey's two stations. Nothing is left whatsoever of Hornsey Bridge Station because nothing's left of the bridge. In fact, it's been replaced by a roundabout and all that remains is the embankment behind me upon which the railway used to be. A little bit inaccessible now thanks to all the uh, undergrowth but it's still there just uh, running parallel to Marlborough Avenue and on downwards to the cycle track. This marks a break in the cycle track where you have to kind of go around the roundabout and rejoin the line across the road. And at this point, this is where the line service haunts his industrial needs because just off to this side were sidings and a goods yard and a goods station and in fact the gas works. But these days nothing's left apart from the embankment and the grounds of the goods yard is now an industrial estate called Hornsey Bridge. And this was where the line was supposed to end, but Joseph Armitage Wade had other ideas. He decided, very late in the building process, that he wanted to continue the line through Hornsey Bridge towards his land on the sea front and build a terminus station within a short walk of the beach. Which was all a great idea, but what Joseph Armitage Wade hadn't considered was the fact that this part of Hornsey was astonishingly boggy and to get the line across here and to his proposed station on the seafront meant the construction of a viaduct along this piece of the track. Now it's been replaced and was replaced fairly quickly with an embankment when it was realised how expensive the viaduct was going to be to maintain but building a viaduct is expensive really expensive and when you consider that the rest of the line had actually been really cheap to build because it was all on the flat lands of East Holderness it basically pumped the price of the line up from £68,000 to £122,000. Now in modern money that's eight and a half million to £15 million. Pounds. That's almost doubled the cost of the line just from adding this tiny extension from Hornsey Bridge to Hornsey Town. Sadly, the Hull and Hornsey Railway never really recovered economically from this massive overspend. 
and as early as 1866 the North Eastern Railway had taken over running of the track and added it to their ever-growing arsenal of railway lines across the north of England. And lastly, we reached the end of the line, the terminus, Haunty Town Station, stood empty and abandoned for many, many years after the closure in 1964, and it was tastefully redeveloped in the 1990s into housing. And it still stands here, looking over the sea just as it has done for 150 years. And it might no longer echo to the pounding of steam engines or the growling of diesels, but it's the end point of a very different kind of journey, because this is the very end of the Trans-Pennine Way, which is a coast-to-coast a -coast cycle route for the intrepid cyclist. It would be hard to talk about Hornsey's growth after the railway arrived without discussing Joseph Armitage Wade in more detail, often styled as the King of Hornsey by the press. He inherited half of his family timber business and a good deal of property, both in Hull and in Hornsey, after a series of unfortunate deaths in the family within only a few years. He'd already made a name for himself as a philanthropist, giving generously to the Kingston General Hospital, various orphanages and refuges, and playing a major role in setting up a house for fallen women to help young women steer clear of a life of prostitution. He agitated against corn laws that were instituted in 1815 and forced the poor to suffer from horrendously expensive food so that wealthy landowners could profit. By bringing the railway here, the exclusively middle class resort was suddenly opened up to the poorer people in Hull and along the line. The number of lodgings and hotels exploded in the following years and even though Joseph might have had to give up the railway company, he by no means gave up on Hornsey. He built the brick and tile works here, the gas works, the water works, petitioned Hornsey for improved sanitation and schools, competed with a bid to build a pier, and encouraged urban development to encourage commuters and retirees to move to the resort, which they did, and in large numbers, prompting the town's vicar, Lindsay Palms, to cry in 1867, we have ceased to be an agricultural village, and Hornsey is becoming a town owing to the railway bringing the families of businessmen in Hull to be residents here. In 1861, the population was only 1,063. By only 1871, it had grown to over 1,600. One of Hornsey's industries that was revitalised by the coming of the railway was the fishing industry. In 1851, there were only three fishermen living here. By the 1890s, that had ballooned to nearly 20. And part of the reason for that was the craze that was sweeping the nation, along with the railways, and largely because of the railways, of fish and chips. The ability to kind of ship fresh fish from all the way to the coast to the most inland landlocked places in England, like Leeds and Wakefield and London, was creating a boom in something that was kind of new. Granted, there had been pie sellers at market fairs for centuries, but this was the first recognisable modern fast food. Fish and chips. And it became quickly associated with the seaside because how much fresher could you get your fish than freshly caught? The railway to Hornsey is a great example of how the railways not only breathed life into already prospering towns on the edge of the reach of the gargantuan industrial cities of Victorian England, but how they completely transformed the lives of farmers, farm workers, and the markets they sold to. Thanks to the network of tiny stations across the country, you could go to a market in a city and buy corn from Holderness, beef from Scotland, and potatoes from, well, anywhere. The railways fed the ravenous industrial cities, encouraging them to grow further and faster and larger. Hornsey itself, under the firm patronage of wealthy hull merchants like Joseph Armitage Wade and William Jackson, developed beyond being a small upmarket bathing resort, and once again became a town with an economy that wasn't wholly dependent on wealthy tourists. The brick and tile plant, the waterworks, and later, of course, Hornsey's famous pottery all ensured that Hornsey was a good deal more able than poor Widensee to the south to withstand the inevitable axing of the line in 1964 as a result of the beaching report. But Hornsey still suffered economically when the railway was taken away. 
Today, Honsi is still a major town in Holderness, with a busy high street, a good tourist trade and a healthy sized population of 8,500. It weathered the bad times and, like Widensey, remains a firm favourite for many families who flock here in their droves on a sunny day to enjoy fish and chips and an ice cream by the sea. And that ends today's journey. Join me next time as we look further into the past than we've ever gone at Hull's very first railway, the Hull and Selby. If you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to click like and subscribe. If you click subscribe, not only do you get notified when a new video comes up, but also you help me to reach more people with these videos. Don't forget, subscribing helps grow the channel.